you will take your copy of the scripture and turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 1 through 21 this morning. And as you're turning there, we're going to be looking at legacy. And although they'll never admit it, every single U.S. president has been concerned about their legacy. They are worried about how people will view them in the future, how history will consider them. And while that's typically true more for presidents who are in their second term when they know they can't be reelected and they want to work on their legacy, it's true for presidents who are in their first term as well. They care about what history will say. You see, part of being a president means being part of a very select group of men who have ever been part of leading on a world scale. That's a very important position. Whether you're a good president or a bad president, there are not many of them. Now, if you ask them if they're concerned about their legacy, presidents will typically demurely say, no, I'm just worried about doing the job of the American people. You've probably heard that before in a press conference. But the reality is, even when they are saying that, they're actually saying, this is what I want my legacy to be remembered, that I was a worker for the American people, right? You know, shake your fist a little bit when you do it. Uh, drives home the point. Well, all of us will leave a legacy in some way or another. Every single one of us. We may not think about it like presidents do, but every one of us has a legacy. It may not be across a sphere of people as big as presidents, but you have influence in other people's lives and you will leave a legacy. And we're all concerned about the legacies that we leave behind, even if it's not a conscious realization. We know that we're gonna leave a legacy and we want it to be a good one. We want our children, we want our grandchildren, we want our friends and family that we have poured ourselves into to continue to grow and thrive. We want that. But just like any other inheritance, the legacy that we leave behind can be either multiplied and expanded or it could be squandered. We may not even leave much in the way of legacy. We may squander it before we even leave it. But this morning, as we begin to dig into the text of the book of Judges, we're going to consider the legacy of a leader. We are going to take a look at Joshua, and we're going to see the impact that his legacy had on the ancient Israelites, at least for a little while, at the beginning. And we're also going to see just how quickly so great a legacy can be squandered even within a single generation. So will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? We're going to read the first three verses out of the first chapter of Judges this morning. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that as we sing our praises to you in worship, we also can come to your word and hear it explained and proclaimed, and that is an act of worship as well. Father, we ask you now to use this time as we study your word to give us that, that feeding that we need from the word. Your word is a feast, every single word of it. And so, Father, even in passages like from Judges that are difficult and, and sometimes we may want to just skim over them, Father, help us to see how every word is important. Every word matters, and we need every single word. Father, we ask you to bless this time together in your son's holy name. Amen. 
Now, it can be difficult to fully measure the influence of a single person, especially when we're talking about someone who is operating on a national level. Joshua certainly faced a difficult moment in time when he comes on the scene in Israel because he is about to inherit what God himself called a stiff-necked people. He, these were unruly, rebellious, self-interested people, and they were fickle. They would go one way or the other with the blowing of the wind. But not only was he inheriting the leadership of the Israelites, he was also the immediate successor to Moses. Now, you want to talk about some big sandals to fill? Moses had big sandals, and, and this is who Joshua is following. But when we see this, and we see in the book of Joshua how he led Israel, we see that he did admirably in that role, and, and he left a tremendous legacy for the people of Israel during this time. He led them on a successful conquest of the promised land. He went in and he routed the Canaanites from these fortified cities, and he established the Israelites firmly in the promised land. He's doing so much there. And then he allotted and allocated the land as God had told him to the different tribes. But at the end of his life, there was still work to do. Isn't that true for all of us? At the end of our life, the work continues on. And he left a legacy for the Israelites to follow. A legacy that we can see here in our passage this morning. And in fact, I think we see three aspects of Joshua's legacy for the Israelites. First of all, we see that Joshua was a man of wholehearted faith. This was a man who was firmly sold out to God. He trusted God. Think back on Joshua's life for just a moment. The first time we meet Joshua in the Pentateuch, it's in, it's in Exodus 17. And what happens is the Israelites have just crossed through the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, and they run into another danger in the Amalekites. And the Amalekites are, are coming in and they're getting ready to fight the Israelites. And Joshua is the one who has chosen to lead the battle against them. You probably remember this story because it's when Moses stood overlooking the battle and he had Aaron on one side and Hur on the other side to hold his arms up because when his arms were raised, they were successful in battle. When he let his arms down, they started to recede. So Aaron and Hur said, well, we'll hold you up, brother. We got you. And the Israelites succeeded under Joshua's leadership there. Next, we discover Joshua sitting at the foot of Mount Sinai while Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law from God. He's up there, and Joshua went with him part of the way. He separated from the camp, and so as a result, he doesn't know what the Israelites have done and what they've convinced Aaron, Moses' brother, to do in casting an idol. And so he wasn't there. He didn't participate in that idolatrous worship. Moses and Joshua were not involved. And then later we know Joshua probably best as being one of the 12 spies commissioned to go into the promised land to evaluate it and to see if the Israelites can take it. And he's one of only two along with Caleb who come back and say, we can do this because the Lord has given us this land. Let's go. Of course, the other 10 spies are like, oh, no, no, no. There's Nephilim in the land. There's giants. They're huge. We can't do this. And of course, we know how that turned out. No, throughout the book that bears his name, Joshua trusted in Yahweh for all things. It doesn't matter if it was big or if it was small. He trusted God for everything because this was a God. This was a guy who had seen God do amazing things. Joshua had been there for the first Passover. He saw how God spared the Israelites of that 10th plague in Egypt. He saw the parting of the Red Sea. He saw the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. He saw manna in the wilderness. He was there at Mount Sinai and heard God. Yeah, he knew. 
that when the Lord spoke, the Lord kept his promises. He was a man who had faith. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't sometimes wonder about what God's plan was. I mean, just think about it. He heard the battle plan for Jericho from the commander of the Lord's army, right? That theophany. And can you imagine getting your army together and saying, okay, God, what's the plan? All right, here's what I'm going to have you do. Get everybody and just march around the city. Really? Just march, march. That's all. Okay, not, okay then we're going to fight, right? Nope, just march. And then after you've marched those seven times, blow your horn. Okay, then we're going to go in, right? Nope, nope, nope. I've got this. That's what God told Joshua. And Joshua, he maybe wondered about it, but he trusted the Lord. He followed him in all things. And so Joshua left this legacy of trusting in the Lord. So Joshua's faith consisted not only of, of knowing God's plan, but also seeing God's actions. It was just like our faith today. We know of God's redemptive history, right? We see it all through the pages of scripture. And then not only in the pages of scripture, we see God's redemptive history moving through history after scripture, right? We see the church moving forward and growing and doing exactly what God had promised that it would do, that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And we see people coming into the kingdom of God and we see people being saved. This is amazing stuff. This is exactly what God promised he would do. We know that from history and we've seen it with our own eyes, haven't we? Is it any wonder that the author of Hebrews would say in chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, I, I, I got to tell you, I really like the way that the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, phrases it. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. That's a very accurate translation of the Greek as well. The reality of what's hoped for. Our hope isn't pie in the sky. It's reality. And, and we have proof, proof of things not seen. That's amazing too, isn't it? We have faith that God will complete the work that he has begun, both in us and in redemptive history. And so Joshua's legacy of wholehearted faith, listen, it began in his home and then it extended to the nation. It began in his home. And we know that you, the Joshua 24, 14, and 50. This is a passage of scripture that many people have on the walls of their home. And I, I don't disagree with that. Listen, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father, the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, Joshua's integrity began and his faithfulness began in his home and it carried on to the nation you see he led israel just like he led his home there was no difference between the two he guarded his home against idolatry he didn't let that come into his house but not only did he not let it come into his house he didn't let it come into the israelites either he fought and guarded and warned against idolatry to the israelites so his integrity begins there and we see the evidence of this great legacy right here in the beginning of verse 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Israelites looked for God's direction of where to go next. They weren't going to figure it out. They were going to ask God. And so Joshua's legacy of faithfulness was being followed by the people. Now we see the second example of his legacy here in the unity of of the Israelites. Now we ought not gloss over this too quickly because unity in the history of Israel was a rare thing. Just like unity among God's people today can be a rare thing. That's unfortunate, isn't it? We see people fighting all the time. 
Now, unless you've been living in a Cold War bunker for the past several years without any contact with the outside world, you know just how divisive our nation has become. People can't seem to speak about anything without immediately going into invective and, and fighting and, and calling everybody anything except a child of God. You see this going on, and it doesn't matter if it's politics or religion or, or what meal you like. People fight over everything. Everything. And we are so divided. I, I couldn't help but to think this week, as we celebrated, uh, celebrated isn't the right word, observed is a better word. We observed the 18th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Now, most of you who were in here were alive and cognizant of that day, September 11th, 2001. And if I asked you where you were and what you were doing, you could probably tell me uh, when you heard the news. Do you remember in the days and the weeks and the months after that, the unity that existed in our nation? People came together. We are just 18 years out from that. Where's the unity? We don't have that anymore. If anything, we're farther apart now than we were before. This is where we are. But it's not just nationally where this disunity exists. Look at within families. Husbands and wives bicker over inconsequential things. Brothers and sisters fight over their parents' estates. Can't tell you how many families I've seen ripped apart over a will. You probably have maybe been part of it. it. You know how horrible that can be. But that's not the case in the aftermath after Joshua's death. Look at verse 3. It says, And Judah said to Simeon his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Now, let's be clear. We're not talking about the individuals of Judah and Simeon. They have been dead for hundreds of years at this point. But we're talking about the tribes. And specifically, in this case, we're talking about the leaders of the tribes of Israel or uh, Judah and Simeon here. And we see that they are working together. They know what they're supposed to do and they're working together in unity to see it achieved. They're so much in unity that the author of Judges can just refer to them as Judah and Simeon. That's how unified they are. They're one. And they're going to go together in unity. So we see right away that there is a unity among leadership. This is one of the legacies that Joshua has. There's a unity of leadership here. And, and that language that Judah uses here, the leaders of Judah, when he says, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you, in the Hebrew, that's emphatic. He is saying, I'm going to do this. I am making a promise to you that if you'll go with me, I'll go with you. We will be like one together. And they're not going to defeat us because the Lord is with us. There's a deep unity here that is more than mere pragmatism. But it's not only the leadership who are united, there was unity among the led. Also, look back at verse 1 with me. It says that the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. Joshua had brought the people together in life and leadership, and they remained so at this point in time. They came together to inquire of the Lord, to see what his purpose was for them. How were they to go into the remaining conquest of the promised land? There was still work to be done, as we noted earlier. There were still remnants of the Canaanites lodged in the different places. And we'll see why a little bit later as we continue to move through these opening chapters of Judges. There was a purpose for that. But the people of Israel together unified as one, went to the Lord, and the Lord answered them.
the Lord said, Judah will go first. And the Israelites accepted that. They were unified in that. And they moved forward as well. Well, that brings us to the third aspect of Joshua's influence. It was an interdependence and cooperation among the people of Israel. You see, when Joshua brought them together in unity, they then moved forward in cooperation with one another. They were interdependent. There wasn't this jockeying of position or this fighting of egos at this point in time for the Israelites. You see, it wasn't like... God had said, Judah will go up first. And Ephraim was like, oh, what am I? Mince liver, right? You know, I'm not, uh, what am I here for? No, they said, okay, Judah goes first. That's fine. We'll go whenever the Lord tells us to go. You see, God has designed us to live and to work in community with one another. We're not an island. No person is designed to be by themselves, to do everything on their own. We are designed social beings. We are designed to be interdependent on one another. I fear one of the great lies that Satan has sold us is that we are just to be fiercely and ruggedly individualistic and we don't need anybody. We're going to be John Wayne. We're going to get on our horse and we're going to ride. Listen, I love John Wayne movies. I just watched one the other day. I enjoy that kind of thing. But listen... We're not made to be that. We're made to work together. We're made to cooperate. And what we find here is that when we are in cooperation, when we do work with one another in unity, we succeed. We succeed. We're not only by God's design, we are also going to succeed. You see, Joshua, in, in his legacy, he modeled this kind of unity, cooperation, and interdependency. Because Joshua was not an autocratic leader. Joshua was not a dictator who came in and said, we're going to do it my way or no way at all. In fact, he said, we're going to do it God's way. But he wasn't the one who said, I'm going to do everything because I'm the only one who can. He wasn't that kind of person. He actually got a team together. He worked with the elders of the tribes of Israel. He worked with the pre, he worked with everybody to form this team of leaders. It's almost as if that's God's design, right? It's exactly what happened. He delegated responsibility and they led. And guess who he learned that principle of delegation from? Moses. Remember in Exodus? Moses is out there trying to answer all the disputes of all the Israelites in the desert all day long. And he's dead when he gets back at the end of the night. And his father-in-law looks at him and says, what are you doing? You're going to kill yourself here. No, allocate, delegate out this responsibility to the, to the tribal elders. And they'll delegate down to some of their lower levels and break it down into more manageable groups. And Moses listened to him and he saw how good that advice was. Listen, your in-laws can have some good advice. Don't just dismiss it because they're your in-laws, okay? There's good advice in there. Listen to them. He learned it from Moses, who learned it from Jethro, and he passed it on in his legacy. Look at verses 4 through 10. We see the initial success that the Israelites experienced under Joshua's leadership. Uh, beginning there in verse 4, Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek, and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. 
And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, in the Negev, and in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba. And they defeated Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai. They had success because they were unified. Everywhere they went, they had success. Think about it. Here is this group of nomadic shepherds and farmers formed into an army going up against Adonai Bezek, the king of Bezek, and they defeat him. And this was no small guy. He was a formidable foe. He had defeated 70 other kings. Cut off their thumbs and their big toes. That was a typical way of humiliating and debilitating people in that time. You don't realize how much your thumbs do until you don't have them. And you don't realize how much your big toe keeps you balanced when you're standing up until you don't have a big toe anymore. Seems like such a little thing, but it's not. You see, they were unified. They knew what they needed to do, and they worked together to achieve it. You know, far too often in the church today, we see different ministries competing with each other within the church, as if they're fighting over a little piece of ministry land, a little fiefdom that they can call their own. And they're going to be the ruler of their own little ministry area. They're not going to work with others. They don't see the unity of being all on the same team, moving in the same direction. No, instead, what they do is they fight because they think, if I don't get something, somebody else will get it. I don't want that. Well, we, we need to be unified. We need to be about the same purpose because we need to be advancing the kingdom of God, just as we sang this morning for the cause of Christ our King. That is where we're going. We need to be unified together for it. I'm thankful that that is not how this church operates. Our ministries aren't fighting against each other, thankfully. We don't have somebody that says, this is the kitchen. You can't come in here. We don't have that. We have people that say, how can we work together to advance the kingdom of God? All of our ministries work interdependently with one another. You know, I'm reminded of that little plaque that sat on the resolute desk in the Oval Office during Ronald Reagan's presidency. And it read, there is no limit to what a person can achieve if he doesn't care who gets the credit. When we're unified, we don't care who gets the credit. And as believers, we don't care that we get any credit at all. Because the credit, the glory, the honor, the praise belongs to the Lord. And that was Joshua's legacy as well. So when Israel operated according to Joshua's legacy of faithfulness, unity, and cooperation, they enjoyed the blessing of great success, both as a nation and individually. But do not be mistaken, it was not because of anything about Joshua himself except his humble yielding to the Lord's direction. You see, it was not about Joshua, it was about God. Joshua never had anything point to himself, he pointed to the Lord. It was the Lord who gave them victory, it was the Lord who gave them success, it was the Lord who gave them direction, it was the Lord who gave them everything. And if we come to the book of Joshua or Judges and we're trying to find the secrets of Joshua's leadership model and try to figure out how we can apply that to our own lives or our own businesses, we are missing the point of these books. Because the point is not about Joshua. The point is not about the Judges. The point is God. He is the central and main character in these books. And it is God who gives the blessings that we find here, both nationally, corporately, and individually. 
Now, at the national level, we see that Israel defeated their enemies when they operated according to Joshua's legacy. And remember, his legacy is one of faithfulness, of unity, and cooperation. And when they followed that, they had victory. But that victory that they had was less about them taking over the land as it was about bringing judgment to the pagan nations who inhabited it. Both were God's purposes. He was going to give the land to Israel because he had promised that land to them in the Abrahamic covenant. But there were people there. And these people, the Canaanites, were pagan idolaters. They were not following the Lord. And so he is going to bring judgment to them. And that's what we see as the, uh, the battle for, for conquest in the land comes up. In fact, the entire battle for this, for Judah, is summarized in one verse. One verse. Verse 4. Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. That seems like something we'd want to know more about. How'd they do it? How, but the author of Judges, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, that's not the point here. That's not the point. Here's the point. The point is God is bringing judgment against his enemies. And we see that with the emphasis of the author of Judges in the words of Adonai Bezek in verse 7. Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. God brought his divine judgment against this ruler of this city for his cruelty, for his tyranny. You see, God's blessing to Israel was also an indictment and a judgment against the idolatrous Canaanites. Now, we might think as we read that, what a barbaric thing to do. I don't know about you, but, you know, if you heard today about somebody saying, well, we captured the city and we took the ruler and we cut off their thumbs and their big toes. You go, oh, if, if you were a military general in the United States and you did that, you would be court-martialed and cashiered. You would be gone. You would not last. But this is what happens. And what we see is that this is exactly what Adonai Bezek did to the other kings that he had conquered. And so we're actually seeing a playing out of the Mosaic law of Lex Talionis, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now listen, don't be deceived by the world today. It's pithy, I know, to say an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. Listen, God's principle of lex talionis is not an aggressive principle. It is not a principle designed to, boy, drive it home to those who have violated our rights or our, our uh, uh, persons or anything like that. No, lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that is a limiting principle. Because what God said is, I know you. If you want to pay somebody back, you will not pay them back fairly. And you've probably heard people say this. I don't get even, I get ahead. Right? When I get revenge on somebody, they know they're never going to get back at me. That is what Lex Talionis prevents. It says the punishment must fit the crime and it cannot be more severe than what the crime itself was. That is what is here. And that is a, uh, a, a people talking in disparaging terms against an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But that is actually an example of God's grace again. But what does that mean for us on this side of Calvary? Didn't Jesus tell us we're supposed to love our enemies and do good to them? This doesn't sound like doing good to Adonai Bezek. How are we to reconcile that today? Well, understand that when Jesus told us that, he told us that as individual believers. We have an individual mandate to treat our enemies better than they treat us. 
We have as individual believers the responsibility to do good to those who do evil to us. And God said, don't take revenge. Vengeance is mine and I will repay. You see, God has ordained government to be that instrument, right? Paul says in Romans 13 that the government has the power of the sword to repay those who do evil, to be a terror to those who do evil. That's part of government's responsibility. Now, we can have an argument over whether government does that well or not, but remember, we do live in a fallen world, and nothing is perfect here, sometimes more so than others, okay? But biblically speaking, the precedent is and the principle is that it is government's responsibility to punish those who do evil. Our responsibility is to trust God and know that he is not deaf or blind to injustice, but that he sees it and he will repay it. Now at the individual, that's at the corporate level, at the individual level, we see that when the Israelites followed Joshua's legacy in their own life, God brought blessing to them as well. And in verses 11 uh, uh, and, and 15, we see this exampled in the model marriage between Othniel and Caleb's daughter, Oxa. Now, in these verses, we see that Caleb offered his daughter as a reward for defeating the people who were in his land, the Canaanites who were in the land that had been allotted to him. And he says, I'll offer my daughter in marriage. Now, listen. In our more egalitarian time, when brides get to choose their own husbands, this sounds awful, okay? But don't be chronological snobs and try to import our morals back on another time. At this time, this is how marriages were arranged. They were arranged by fathers. That was their responsibility. But in this passage, we're actually introduced for the first time to the first of the judges, Othniel, who is Caleb's nephew, and he fought bravely at the town of Kiriath Sefer. And we must remember that God had been very clear to the Israelites during this time. He said, when you go into the land, you will not make a peace treaty with them, and you will not intermarry with them. Those two things are linked because it was often through marriages that treaties were formed. And alliances were made. And God said, you will have none of that. You can't intermarry with them. Because, he said, I want you to take for yourselves people from within the covenant people of Israel. I want you to marry among people who believe in the one true God. That is the, that is the point here. And he, he did that because he knew that if the Israelites married in to the pagan Canaanites, here's what would happen. The paganism would be syncretized with the true worship of God, and the true worship of God would be fatally compromised. That's what happens every time you try to import something into the true faith. You add anything to the true faith, you destroy the true faith. That's just the way that it works. And so this principle that we see here, that God wanted them to marry within their own covenantal people, is also repeated in the New Testament when Paul said in 2 Corinthians, 2, or 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? You see, as a general principle... As a general principle, when a believer marries an unbeliever, you have two people bound together in marriage who are going in opposite directions. But when, again, as a general principle, when you have two believers married, they're moving in the same direction. They're unified. That's the principle here. And that's what he's trying to show, all right? And when you have two believers united in marriage, it's actually a blessing not only to the betrothed, but to their families as well. Being united with another believer in marriage, that most intimate of relationships, a, a relationship that is, is designed by God to represent the relationship between Christ and his church, you need to be moving in the same direction. If you're unequally yoked and going in two different directions, it's not going to go well. It's not going to work well. It's not going to work as God designed it 
to be. But this marriage between Othniel and Oxa, it was a representation of the blessing of God on Israel as a whole and on those who faithfully obeyed his commands. You see, Caleb never considered offering his daughter in marriage to a Canaanite. He, was, he wasn't able to take over that city of, of uh, Kiriath uh, Sefer. He wasn't able to conquer it. He needed help. And so he's offering his daughter in marriage. The world would have said, Caleb, offer your daughter in marriage to the rulers of Kiriath Sefer. And that way you guys can just live together in unity with the pagans in that land. Caleb said, no. Because God said not to. And Othniel, the same thing. He said, I'm not going to marry a Canaanite woman. I'm going to marry an Israelite woman. Just as God commanded. I'm going to be faithful to his commands. And that, that idea of intermarriage, that comes in later in the book of Judges. To disastrous consequences. Even for the judges themselves. Just consider Samson. You see, the result of the marriage of Othniel and Oxa, it represented that the land was conquered by the Israelites as a blessing by God. There was victory over the enemy. There were springs of life and there was fertility. You see, there's a great blessing from God to his people when they follow him. And we see that in these early verses of Judges. God blesses obedience. And faithful obedience was the legacy of Joshua. However, by the time we get to verse 19, we begin to see indications that the subsequent generation, despite the example of his legacy, is soon going to depart from it. There is a great danger in complacency. There is a great danger in saying, hey, everything's going great. We can just put it on cruise control and it'll be fine. No, we must stay vigilant. And the first crack in the foundation that we see shows up in verse 19. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. We see here Judah's fear. Judah was afraid. The, these chariots of iron, chariots don't work in hill country. They work good on flat land, but they weren't so good if you're running through hills, right? So Judah was able to take over the hill country. They went for the low-hanging fruit, and they succeeded. But then they looked down to the other area they were supposed to go into because who was with them? The Lord. And they were supposed to take it just as the Lord told them to do. He said, I'm with you. You can do it. But Judah saw the chariots of iron. And they saw their bronze weapons, and they said, our weapons can't compete. Our weapons can't fight against them. They were afraid. And so as a result, they didn't even try. The Lord was with them. Listen, this is not the first time Israel has seen chariots. They fought against chariots with the Egyptians when the Egyptians were chasing them. And do you think that that group of former slaves, I mean, immediately former slaves, were in any way situated to fight the speedy chariots of Egypt? No. Not by the world's standards, not by the world's estimation, but guess what? Israel defeated them. Well, God did. He used Israel. And he defeated them. This generation should know that. Chariots are nothing compared to the Lord. If the Lord is for us, who can be against us? If the Lord is for us, what weapon can be forged against us? There isn't one. Not one that will be successful. They may try. But if we trust in him, if we know the promise of God... Why are we fearful when we see the seemingly mighty power of our enemies and their weapons? No, brothers and sisters, we need to stand firm in the power of him who is with us, who goes before us, and who secures the victory. Let us stand firm. 
But Judah was fearful. We see that. But in verse 21, we see Benjamin just flat out failed to do what they had been commanded. Read that with me. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Now, the geography of Jerusalem, because of how it's situated on a hill, probably made it a little bit more difficult to overtake. But Jericho was an incredibly fortified city, and the Israelites overtook it by marching and blowing a horn. Because it wasn't the Israelites' mighty military power that did it. It was God. And so the Benjamites, they come to Israel, or to Jerusalem, and oh, this is too hard. This is too hard. We can't get the Jebusites out of there. So, apparently, they made a treaty with the Jebusites. Because the author of Judges says, they're living together in the city even to this day. They're still there. And we're going to see that that's a foreshadowing of what happens to Benjamin later in the book of Judges. Terrible things. Terrible troubles here. You see, there's a consequence when God's people make peace with the world. When we try to form an alliance with the world so that the world and the church can take up residence together, it is the church that is going to suffer. It is the church who has been called to be distinct who is called to be holy, who is called to be the light in the world, the city on a hill, when we give that up and we compromise, then the gospel gets watered down. We start neglecting the moral law of God and his commands. And before long, the church looks like any other worldly group of people. Brothers and sisters, the message of the gospel is too precious for us to compromise it. Because the message of the gospel is the only means of salvation for people who are lost, dying, and going to hell. We cannot compromise with the world. We cannot let the world come in and dictate to us how things are going to be. Because you see, in the end, the world will never accept the church so long as she stands for the gospel. But as soon as she surrenders the gospel, the world will have no further use of the church. Because the world has enough clubs. The world has enough organizations and social groups. It doesn't need the church. The world wants to destroy the church. Let's not do that. Let's resist the temptation to compromise in return for acceptance by this world. Acceptance by the world it actually puts us at enmity with God. That's what the Bible says. So let us stand firm on the faith that is once for all delivered to the saints. We have the power of the gospel. Now, these two examples at the end of our passage this morning are but a taste of things to come in the book of Judges. We're going to see that this pattern of decline, of compromise, of apostasy just picks up steam. And the blessing of a faithful legacy that has been passed down from Joshua has been squandered. And the nation of Israel is about to embark on this downward spiral of abandonment, of apostasy, of destruction. That's what we're going to see in that repeated cycle. But even though Israel will repeatedly be unfaithful to God, God is always faithful to her. God does not give up on his people. Church, you need to hear that again. God does not give up on his people. If you belong to Christ, you are his people. If you are saved by the blood of Christ, you are his. And no matter what weapon this world forms against you, it will not prosper. It will not succeed. Because the Lord is with you. Let's not be fearful. We don't need to be Judah and be afraid. We don't need to be Benjamin and just flat out fail. We can be successful if we follow the Lord. 
And so this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to be right down here as we sing our final song this morning. And I want you to come and talk to me. Let me introduce you to the one true Savior who will be faithful to you forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for the legacy of Joshua that we have seen in this passage this morning. And Father, we also thank you for the warning that we see of what happens when an inheritance like this is squandered. Father, we pray that the legacy of those that have gone on before us, those faithful brothers and sisters who have stood firm for the faith, let that be an example to us today, Father. Let us resist that temptation to become like the world. Father, the world is never going to accept us. Help us to understand that. But Father, we have something so much greater, so much more powerful, and infinitely more important. We have the gospel. Father, may we be true to it. May we share it. May we invite people to the kingdom, to the wedding feast of the Lamb, and to the eternal life that has been promised to us through the Son. It's in his name and by his will we pray. Amen.